data one more time. And early on, and he's a he's he's a perfectionist. I mean, it's got to be exactly every detail of that spacesuit. Everything's got to be right. But early on, all he did was paint from pictures that we had taken on the moon. And then later on, and you know, after he'd done it a few years, he he took a little artistic license and created what might have been, and had a had a picture of. Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon and himself on the surface of the moon. Well, the three of them were never on the surface of the moon, but that's an all Navy crew. And so he did that. And he, and, and he's just, he's just, there's nothing he can't paint and, and it just gets better and better all the time. He truly is. And you tell him, I call him the Remington of the space age because, uh, no one else can, you know, some people can capture it in words. Some people, are, are uh, superb photographers and can see the kind of kind of pictures they want to take, but Al, is, uh, there's nobody nobody has ever done what Alan's done in terms of painting, with the colors and with the dimensions and with the it's just strictly strictly space. Hmm. Now to change gears to Apollo 17. 17. Your your command. The the flight was the first to go up at night the only yeah, the only apollo flight only to go apollo. at night was apollo 17 and you know i i i wouldn't trade the position i watched it from for a minute but i've heard so many dramatic stories about what it looked like from the outside like like the universe lit up from without like a thousand suns and i got to tell you it was pretty impressive inside it was also the first mission with somebody who wasn't military, it, with uh, Jack Schmidt. Not only was not, we had a crew, Ron Evans was a naval aviator, he a Vietnam veteran, and then this was the last flight of Apollo and we had a lunar geologist in the program. And uh, it was determined by others that a that that he should fly last flight. We got a lunar geologist. He's trained as a backup crew. It made a lot of sense, but it was hard personally to stomach for a while because my my original backup crew for Apollo 14 is a crew that that might have there was no guarantee, but it might have rotated to Apollo 17. And my lunar module pilot was an X-15 pilot. That's not a bad guy to have around over watching your right side over there. There's a wingman over there. Jack Schmidt was not an aviator. He learned to fly. He was not an aviator, but he was he, he was he was uh, did a wonderful job. He he learned well. He had a good technical background as a geologist. He did an outstanding job. And uh, and 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 when we we're literally on the surface, he was in his test tube. Lunar geologist on a lunar surface, he was in a test tube. So he looked at the microgeology, and although I, we, I studied, the rest of us all studied geology and went on field trips and what have you, uh, I was a macrogeologist. I didn't really care where that pebble came from, I cared where the mountains came from. So between the two of us, we were able to put a picture together, and I think it worked out very well. And there was a right decision to, to make. With those f types of factors in in the last Apollo mission, though, was at, at any given time did it, did your military background help overcome the fact that this was the first night flight, or that you were working with somebody who wasn't military? Jack was not only non-military. Jack had no concept of military discipline, of military pecking order. Uh, it took a while for. Jack to understand that I was commander of the crew, that you just didn't go to your, somebody's boss up there and tell them you didn't like what's going on or you wanted to change things, go to a different landing site. Or you come to me and we talk about it and you know, that's the way it was. That's the way, and, and, and all, of, all of our flights, we, we were most all military aviators and, and that's the way it worked. The commander of the crew was the commander of the crew. He was a captain of the ship. And Jack didn't understand that for a long time, but we finally got that squared away. And and as I say, it it, 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 it from that point on, it it all worked very very well. Now, when you were actually on Taurus Litro and with the lunar uh, rover, well, let me back up. <laughs> let me back up to to Jack Schmidt okay. being in the right seat. 
I'm one of those guys that likes to be in control. I want to be in control of my own destiny. Jack knew the business of that spacecraft very well. He was there primarily to do the geology on the surface, but he had he had a responsibility in a spacecraft, in both spacecraft. And you got to remember, I'd been on, I've been in his position both both in the command module and in the lunar module on Apollo 10. I knew that side of the spacecraft like the back of my hand. Well, when I was also over there, I learned, the, I, my, I like to know as much as I possibly could. And so I was very confident in the job that he was to perform. And now I'm on the left side of the spacecraft as commander, effectively in control. But I was very confident that if we had a problem or a question or had to do something that had to be done on the right side of spacecraft, I could either tell him what to do or do it myself. So, you know, I, I, I'm a control freak in that respect. I, if, if I'm out there on the way to the moon a quarter million miles away, I guarantee you I'm going to be in control of my own destiny. You know, I fully understood that there were, we, we, were, we were vulnerable to a whole host of unknown potential problems. But by golly, I was going to be prepared to know as much as I could about what we thought might happen so that we could confront those problems if and when they occurred. So I was very comfortable with Jack Schmidt being in the right side. I didn't need another aviator in the right side of that spacecraft. Not that I could have flown it myself, but I was confident that I could make sure he was doing what needed to be done. The lunar rover, and I, I would imagine that you probably understand where I'm about to go with this, but you had a problem with the fender, and the fender uh, had broke off, and the technique that you used to fix it was that similar to something that you might see on the flight deck where you just might need a little spit and glue. <laughs> the little little beta. The, the, the problem uh, with the lunar rover fender on the surface of the moon was not a problem with the fender. It was a problem with the commander, with me. Because I had, uh, it, the lunar rover basically had to be unfolded and assembled on the surface of the moon. And we had telescoping plastic fenders. Everything was light. Weight was important. So everything was as light as possibly could. The, the wheels were just woven panel wire is what it was. And, and we, we needed the fenders to keep the dust, the rooster tail and dust from going over the top of everything on your visor, on the equipment, on everything. It was very, dust is another problem, very detrimental. And I was, had a habit of putting my rock hammer in a pocket down here and I was working around a lunar, lunar rover and I caught the hammer under a piece of that fender and popped it off. So it wasn't the fender, it was the commander. And uh, very innovatively we, 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 we tried to find a way, uh, we had to fix that fender or make a fender do something and innovatively on the ground they came up with the go ahead and uh, taking four geology maps that we had, we had many extra geology maps, and taping them together and then clamping them on the fender. But we couldn't do it outside the spacecraft because, you know, you get tape and you get dust on it, it doesn't stick. We had to make the fenders that night inside the spacecraft, take them outside the next day, and use a couple light clamps that we held, had held lights on in lunar module to clamp the fender on. And the unique thing about that little fix is the tape happen to be duct tape. You know, never leave home without duct tape, even when you go to the moon. But it was an, an innovative thing. When you have an emergency, when you have a problem, you got something to be fixed, and you can't call roadside assistance at that point in time, you come up with a fix. Now, it might take you, you know, you might have to take that, that, that bird down to the hangar deck for a few hours and, and, and recycle it and put it on the next launch. But if it's that kind of problem and you can come up with a fix, if you can come up with uh, something innovative to solve the problem at hand because you need to get the job done, you need to get that, that aircraft off the ship, it's amazing 
how innovative human beings can be uh, when they really put their mind to it. Now, is there anything, any amount of training or really anything at all that can prepare you for space and being on the moon and being just thousands and thousands of miles? You know, you, there's, there's, you, you can, what you never could train for the entire mission. You could never train for the emotion of that 14 minutes of descending on the surface of the moon. I mean, it, you, it, in a simulator, you know, if you made a mistake, if you ran into a problem you couldn't handle, if you were gonna spin, crash, and burn, you hit the freeze button, you go out, talk to the folks, have a cup of coffee, and say, well, I could have done it this way, I could have done it that way. There is nothing that can prepare you for the real world until you're in the real world. Well, there's a lot of things that can prepare it for you. It's your commitment. You want to know everything you can. You want to be as prepared as you can. You want to be as determined. And, and I, I've always said, I didn't go to the moon not to come home. That was, that was not my plan. I, I knew that the possibilities were there. But so when, and when I was coming down, for instance, coming down on the descent itself to the surface of the moon, very dynamic, noisy, people are talking to you. Uh, vibration, lots going on. Uh, you're coming down on your back. You really don't see the moon until you're, you start down from 50,000 feet and you really don't pitch over. And, and you're flying a vehicle for the most part. And you, you pitch over at 7,000 feet. And we landed in a valley that was surrounded by mountains on three sides higher than the Grand Canyon is deep. And all of a sudden, man, you are down among them. And, and the ground's telling you things, your partner's giving you numbers, and you're looking out the window, and you're, you're flying needles, and watching what the radar is telling you. You get down to about 200 feet, and you get to what we call the dead man's curve. You're gonna land one way, and if the descent engine quits, you're gonna land, because you don't have time to separate the two vehicles, fire the ascent engine, and get out of there. You gotta come down fast enough so you don't run out of fuel but you gotta come down slow enough so you can stop your rate of descent. About 80 feet you run into dust. You go IFR, you can't really see much of anything. And at that point in time, I, you know, the ground can't tell you anything. I, I, told, I told my partner, uh, Jack Schmidt in the right seat, I said, I don't wanna hear anymore. Yeah, yeah you, you're, you're eyeball, you're, you've made a determination where you're gonna land. And you know how much fuel you got you're committed at that point in time, and uh, you, you, you touch, you get an indication that you're in a, with about three meters of the surface by a little light that goes on. As soon as that happens, you shut down. Shut the engine down, because if you don't and you land with the engine running, the back pressure, they determine the back pressure might be so great it would blow up the lunar module when you land it. So, you know, you're not gonna let that happen either. And when you touch down, you shut the engine down and plunk, the dust is gone. The vibration is gone. The, the, the noise is gone. Nobody's talking. And all of a sudden you realize for what could have been 10 seconds or 10 minutes, I don't know, that you are now seeing what has never been seen with human eyes before. You are now where no human beings have ever been in the history of mankind ever before. And, and the first thing you do is listen and look at the gauges to make sure you didn't break something. Because if you did, you're going to have to get it out of there in a hurry. And once you're happy with that, and all that happens in a matter of seconds, quite honestly, uh, you tell, tell the ground that uh, the Challenger has landed in the Valley of Taurus Litro. And from then on, it's, it's, it's three days, and a lot of people say, well, you know, did you think you weren't gonna ever get, did you ever think about it might not lift off? You're there. You shut the engine down. You, you know, you, you, you turned everything off except the environmental control system. Do you think it's gonna start? Do you think it's gonna work? Do you think that you power down all the avionics and the computer because you don't have enough battery power to keep them running? No, you don't worry about that until the time comes. You are there, you made a commitment. If you were worried about that, you shouldn't have gone. You should have stayed home. And, and so I think all of that plays into your Navy training. Uh, you know, I, when I was coming down on a descent, it was me. 
Nobody else was going to help me. They were in the, the ground couldn't fly my airplane for me any more than it could make a night carrier landing for me. It what was going to happen, and a guy on the right was giving you some information, that's fine, but he wouldn't fly, and I was. You know, you got more technology, by the way, in your iPhone today than I had both of my hands when I landed on the moon, but that's what I had to work with. And that's why I, I've often compared it to a night carrier landing. It's just you and your maker. If it's going to happen, you're going to make it happen. And, and without question, I think it goes back to the training that gave you not just the opportunity, but the determination to, to, to come back aboard ship, particularly at night. And that's no small feat. Even today, we're watching young pilots do it hands off. It's crazy. Uh, but, but that's very comparable. And, and what is it that, 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 although things are happening fast during a landing on a moon, I'm, I'm going to make it happen. There was no question in my mind. And if a problem occurred and I had to board, I was prepared to do that. Just like you're prepared to take it around aboard a carrier at night if it isn't a perfect landing. But this time we didn't have a chance to come around again. So the determination and the commitment that you had was to do it right the first time because you're not going to get a second chance. And, 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 and that relates very closely to the attitude you had to have and the training you had as a naval aviator. Is that what makes a difference? Uh, is, is that We didn't have a 12,000 feet of concrete to land on on the moon, but you don't abort at aboard ship either. Is that what makes the difference? Is that why five out of six lunar landings were commanded by naval aviators? I'll let someone else figure out the answer to that one. Now, it, I, I'm fine if you, I'm not, I'm, I'm fine. I, 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 in my mind, I gave you an hour and a half anyway, so I'm fine. <laughs> if you are, you okay? Okay. Um, They're going to edit this down to two minutes anyway. So. In the years since you've retired the Navy and NASA, what do you think of the direction of the Navy and, and aviation as a whole? Well, I think uh, aviation as a whole is, of course, cer you're certainly making maximum use of the technology as, as, as it evolves. Uh, uh, there's some things I don't like what I see. Uh, particularly in naval aviation. I think we've gotten way, way, way too politically correct. Uh, there's a way to get a job done with, you know, and it may offend a few people along the way, uh, but that's the way it is. Uh, and you can politically correct yourself right out of business. Uh, there were some, some, uh, I'll, I'll be very honest, uh, uh, there were some parts of the naval aviation celebration which picked quote, historical moments in naval aviation history, which were absurd. What happened to the, to, to the, to the Battle of Leyte Gulf and Midway and Vietnam, and what happened to the first carrier landing and, and Ellison, and, 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 and what happened to the real history, what happened to the first landing on the moon, which, a nav which was a, 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 a na national event, but it was also a naval aviation event. Uh, what happened to the real historical moments in the history of naval aviation over the last hundred years? And I, quite frankly, I think we got some people who were making decisions in Washington who never were a, a, a and never landed aboard ship, uh, who were saying, "Well, this was important. This is politically correct. This is the thing we ought to celebrate." Who were finally, I believe, for the most part, overruled, because naval aviators for generations said, "Time out." This is not the Navy I've known. And if there's any criticism I've got today is we're too overwhelmed with diversity. We're too overwhelmed with political correctness. Let's get back to being the Navy, na Navy that I know, the Naval Aviation that won the Battle of the Pacific. And we didn't do it with political correctness. We did it with determination and raw guts and commitment and passion. And, and, uh, and, and that is not... Uh, that is not a distraction from from what people want to make happen in the future, but it's what it's what we are all about, quite frankly. Um, how important how important is flight 
and right now there's so much being done with unmanned aviation and but how important is manned flight oh uh, man flight whether it's uh, whether it's in military aviation or or uh, space flight is significantly important we you know we've never had a ticker tape parade in New York City for a robot. People want to know what it looks like. How did you feel? Were you scared? What did you think about it? In terms of space, unmanned probes and vehicles are significantly important. They pave the way. They give you answers that you don't have to waste time on and, and, and worry about the human experience before you send a human. But curiosity is the essence of, of human existence. We want to be there. We want to see it. We want to, we want to go there. And plus the fact is, that human beings can make, uh, can make decisions that robots and computers can't. Because robots and computers are only as smart as we make them. But when you're there, new things happen. And this is the smartest computer in the world. And only, only a human being can make the decisions that might save a mission. Uh, that might, we might find out something we might not have even known if, we, if a human being weren't there. In terms of aviation, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, the unmanned part of, of, of aviation across the board uh, is significantly important. We can do things and we can see things. We can, we can send vehicles in harm's way uh, to do a, quote, a routine job that, that we don't have to send a human being into and risk the life of a human being and probably a far more expensive aircraft. But they, too, are only our only pathfinders. They, too, are only pave in a way and and we're going to have you know if you can come aboard if you can land if you can land it and we probably could if you can land it or the Russians did it with their shuttle they landed it without a human being in it we can you, you know you can dock unmanned in space mechanically or electronically without a human being in it. we can now come aboard ship hands hands free you know and, which is a phenomenal piece of technology uh, and we'll have unmanned vehicles uh, launching and landing on aboard ships, and they will definitely serve a purpose. But I don't think we will ever, ever quite be ready to replace the human beings. We, you know, it, it, it wasn't good enough for Lewis and Clark to send an empty canoe up the Missouri River. Okay, that's my answer to your question. <laughs> Is there any message that you'd like to give young sailors or and or aviators yeah uh, lessons I learned without knowing and I think for the most part from my dad uh, just uh, just don't ever give up you know, good is never going to be good enough go out and do your best uh, and I said as my dad told me is someday uh, you truly indeed may surprise yourself fate just don't don't turn down don't turn your back on opportunity and don't worry about being the underdog i felt like i was the underdog all my life in the space program and i ended up going to the moon twice and a couple other people have done that i commanded my own mission i'm the only commander of an apollo mission of any mission during those days uh who never had an opportunity to go to test pilot school unheard of unheard of when I was selected for the space program I don't know that anyone could have looked far enough in the future to see me as command of a mission and it was finally as far as I'm concerned not the first but as far as I'm concerned it was probably the best uh, I tell young people to uh, to always shoot for the moon maybe not literally but figuratively always shoot for the moon because even if you miss you're gonna land somewhere among the stars don't wait for someone else to do it for you. Go out and make it happen yourself. Be in control of your own destiny. And have faith in a lot of people who are helping you to accomplish your dreams. The dreamers of today, dream, dream, dream. The dream I dreamed as a, as a 10 year old. The dreamers of today are the doers of tomorrow. So be a dreamer. Is there anything that I may have missed? Anything that you'd like to add? 
Oh, I don't know, Golly, you covered most of everything. <laughs> I, 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 the two things that have been the biggest part of my life, all my life, are naval aviation uh, and my education I received from Purdue. And to this day, you know, Purdue claims the first steps and the last steps on the moon. Both Neil Armstrong and I went to Purdue, plus a lot of other uh, astronauts that have gone through the program. And so the two things that I focus on in, in, in this period of my life that I can spend some time supporting in uh, are, are naval aviation and Purdue University. And one of the most gratifying things is, and it happened to me here today in the cafeteria at the, at the Johnson Space Center, I realize that I do have an impact on young people. A, uh, a young man, a co-op student from Seattle going to University of Colorado recognized me and came in and thanked me for all I'd done for inspiring him to dream about coming down here and working, being an EVA expert. I have 40 and 50 year olds today coming up to me and thank you, I'm a doctor, I'm a pilot, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, I'm a teacher, thanking me for what they had become because of the inspiration I gave them. I didn't give them the inspiration, they grew up in an environment that gave them the inspiration to dream and now they are uh, uh, indeed the doers. And, and that's a hell of a, that, that's a heck of a responsibility. But it's, a, a friend of mine said, Gene, you've got to realize that other people don't look at you the way you look at yourself. I accept that and I know it, but I'm still put my pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. But I do have an impact on some of those young dreamers out there. And as long as I do have the impact, I got a responsibility to respond to them. Awesome, <laughs> you like that the empty canoe going up the river, uh, didn't you? Huh? I, 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 I said I that. Went, I, I just said went you on that. That you can't I, send, you know, machines out there. You I said that in testimony uh, three weeks ago in, in in Washington to the House Science and Technology Committee. I used that same example about Lewis and Clark sending an empty canoe up the river. I, I expanded on it a little bit. Uh, and I've had some, and, and it's may, I, it just came off the top of my head, but, but I got some positive response, and you just gave me some <laughs> positive response to Pretty good example, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. You can't say nothing up there. <laughs> it's a human experience. Well, you got enough to work with for a lifetime. <laughs>